Well, greetings. Um, again, we're still in the Epistle to the Hebrews, and we're now moving into chapter 9. And this is quite a long chapter. I'm going to try and deal with it in one message. It's very clear, uh, is this chapter, and it does follow on from what I've been saying previously. And with these messages, it, there really needs to be some sense of continuity in following it through. Just taking them individually is not quite as simple. Anyway, so with chapter 9, this is how we start. This is Paul speaking, as you know, Paul wrote this. He said, and remember, as I've been trying to remind you each time, that uh, the Hebrews were the Hebrew people, the Jewish people, and therefore they were aware, and probably more aware than you and I, of the significance of what we're now going to deal with. Because he says, then truly, oh, by the way, I'm in the authorized, the King James, because somehow I don't know, I think the King James, to me, is better uh, in this particular chapter. So truly, the first covenant had also ordinances of divine service and a worldly sanctuary, in other words, a visible, factual sanctuary. So in verse 2, he explains it a bit more. This sanctuary, uh, which was part of the first covenant, and which had all the offices and the different things laid out previously, um, starting with the revelation with Moses and so on, the, this that was built um, is called both in the English authorized and in the um, other revised versions, it's called a tabernacle. Now, literally, a tabernacle can be regarded as a tent, <laughs> but it was obviously something more than that. But it was uh, it was a man-made place, and it was uh, clear enough that if you look, there was a, a tabernacle made, the first part, uh, in the first part was the candlestick and the table and the showbread. Now, this basically was called the sanctuary. And it's very significant that if we're looking at uh, worship and looking at our spiritual experience, very often uh, preachers and hymns will speak about entering into the sanctuary. But remember that in the Bible, the sanctuary was the outer part, the outer court. Right. Then there was a second veil or curtain. And that curtain, by the way, was carried into David's, or I'm going to call it David's temple, the one that Solomon built, that also had the veil because the veil, significantly when Jesus died, was split open. So after that second veil, there is another tabernacle, and this one is called the holiest of all, the holy place. And in this second part, you had the golden censer, you had the Ark of the Covenant, which was covered in gold. And in that Ark of the Covenant was the golden pot that held the manna from the wilderness. Come on, you know, when they were grumbling, there was no food. God sent manna and fed them with manna. They kept part of it in here. Also, they had Aaron's rod that budded and the tables. The tables, these were the stone uh, tables 
of the covenant. These were the ones on which the Ten Commandments were written. And then over all of this were the cherubims of glory which overshadowed what the Bible calls the mercy seat. Now, Paul says we can't particularly speak about that now, um, and neither can I in fullness. We'll deal with that later. But very often the mercy seat is referred to spiritually as a place where we meet with God. We meet with God at today. We meet with him symbolically at the mercy seat, hence its name. Anyway, in verse 6, it then explains, now when these things were first planned or ordained, the priests went only into the first tabernacle in order to accomplish all the elements that they were allowed to do in worship. Now, you've got that. There are two tabernacles, the outer one, which where the priest went, and in verse 7, into the second inner tabernacle, only the high priest was allowed to go, and he could only go once every year. He could not go in without blood which he offered for himself and for the sins of the people. So it's quite clear that the only person who could make the offering for sin under the Old Testament, the Old Covenant, was the high priest. He did it once a year, and he did it with an offering of blood. Now, in verse 8, the Holy Ghost signifies that the way into the holiest was not made manifest while the first tabernacle was standing. Now, what Paul is saying here, got to get this quite right, the Holy Spirit signifies that the way into that inner holy place that only the high priest could go, was not permitted while they had that first tabernacle, the whole complete thing, the two sections. Because, in verse 9, this earthly tabernacle made with hands in which the Israelites actually had to carry for 40 years through the wilderness, remember, and which eventually was put into the new temple built in David's time. But this, in verse 9, was a pattern, a figure, an illustration of what happened in the present, the old time, when there had to be offered gifts and sacrifices. But even for the high priest, what he did, what he offered, the sacrifices and the gifts, only covered in a limited way. It had to be repeated every year. First, look at verse 10. Because this earthly covenant stood only in meat and drink and washings and carnal ordinances imposed on the people of God until, and there's a very interesting word here in the um, authorized Bible, imposed until the time of Reformation. Now, to us, the Reformation was <laughs> the breakaway from the Catholic Church 500 years ago. But here, they're using the same pause, using the same expression until the time when everything would be changed, reformed, changed. And I want you to notice this, that 
when Christ came, he put an end to the old and opened a whole new dispensation. Verse 11, it says, Christ, who became and came as a high priest, but a high priest in anticipation, this was in his life, in his life, he came in anticipation of the new covenant that would be greater, more perfect, and even the tabernacle would now no longer be made with hands, that is, as Paul says, not of this building, not built like these. And in this, he is referencing both the tabernacle in the wilderness, as we would call it, and David's temple. So these were made with hands, and the sacrifice was made with hands. Do you get it? Under the old covenant, the sacrifices were made by men. The temple was made by men. But now you see something different in verse 12. So that now no longer are the blood of goats and calves sufficient. And verse 12 is absolutely clear under the new covenant, which when Jesus was born didn't happen. Remember, this can only happen after 33 years because if you look at this uh, in verse 13, when well, verse 12, uh, it says, not by the blood of goats and calves, but by his own blood. Have you got it? By his own blood, he entered in once into the holy place, having already obtained an eternal redemption for us. Now we have a high priest who is the Son of God, who is not only high priest, but he is also the sacrifice. So now, now it's no longer bulls, sheep, goats, or whatever. Those, those are passed away. They were only for a time. Now they were only a picture. Get it right. These Old Testament offerings, sacrifices, tabernacle were only a brief picture or vision of what one day would come with Christ. So in verse 13, if the blood of bulls and of goats and the ashes of a heifer sprinkling the unclean sanctified and purified the flesh, verse 14, how much more shall the blood of Christ, who through the eternal spirit offered himself without spot, like the lamb, without blemish. You know, the sacrifice had to be without blemish. He, without blemish before God, offered himself to God in order to change our experience and to clear our conscience from all the deadness of the old works, that we could now serve directly the living God. And in verse 15, that's why Christ has become not just a high priest. Notice the word now being used. For this cause, he is the mediator of the New Testament. In other words, the mediator is the someone who comes between us. It comes between us and God. And he was to become the mediator, the means by which we can access this new covenant, the New Testament. 
And it's very interesting the way Paul expresses it because he says he is the mediator of this New Testament that by means of the death for the redemption of the transgressions that were under the First Testament, that they which are called might receive the promise of an eternal inheritance. Look at verse 16. I think it explains it even better. For where a testimony is, there must also of necessity be the death of the testator. This is a will, testament, will. We know what that is. Uh, when somebody dies, they leave a will to dispose of uh, their assets and decide where it goes to. <laughs> um, I mean, many of you know my wife died more than eight years ago, and she and I had the same type of wills that when she died, everything came to me. If I died first, everything went to her. Ah, everything. Now, strangely enough, what my wife and I did is a perfect picture of what Christ has done. Because when he died, through his death, his testament, his will, gives us the right to inherit everything that he had. You know, this is something, somehow this is something the church doesn't seem to understand. A lot of preachers don't seem to understand. Certainly, uh, state churches don't uh, seem to understand this, that because Christ died, the testament, the will that he left, means that we inherit through him all that he had. His power, his blessing, his relationship with his father. Oh, I could take a long time on going into explain this. Do you understand? You see, in verse 17, it says, this testament or will is a force only after men are dead. Otherwise, it's no strength. Is it? I, I couldn't leave anything to my wife because I was alive. My wife left everything to me only because she was dead. Do you understand? This test, that's why Christ had to die. He, uh, uh, his death purged our sin, cleansed our sin because he was high priest and he was sacrificed. But also, this is what the church doesn't seem to grasp, that because he died, the testimony that he left is we inherit all that he had. Oh, do you know, this is where the church misses out on so much. We, can, we are partakers now. We can live in, oh, the power, the relationship that Jesus had with his father. That's why he introduced uh, him to us as father. And this is why he said, when the Holy Spirit has come, you will receive the power and everything. So through the Holy Spirit, this is made manifest in us. We inherit you and I have the power to inherit, to receive, and to live with all the blessings that Jesus had. So coming to verse 18, therefore, neither uh, the, the, the first covenant, the first testament couldn't be dedicated without blood. Because in verse 19, when Moses had spoken every precept of the law to the people, even he, Moses, in order to initiate, to instigate the old custom, the old testament, the old covenant, he had to take the blood of calves, goats with water, sprinkled with scarlet wool and hyssop and sprinkled with a book and, and so on. And he said in verse 20, this is the blood of the testament which God has enjoined unto you. Moreover, verse 21, he sprinkled also with blood the tabernacle and all the vessels of the ministry. 
verse 22, and almost all things are by the law purged with blood, and without the shedding of blood, there is no remission of sin. So you understand that even going back to the time of Moses, when God gave the law, the law came from Moses, that's, that's what the scripture says, even that first law had to be sealed with the blood of the sacrifice. But it was only a temporary thing. It was only a picture, an illustration of what one day would come. And that's why it had to be repeated. Now we don't need it anymore. We don't repeat this sacrifice. This is, sorry to say, what is wrong with some people's understanding of a communion service. That's not Jesus there. It's not actually his body and his blood. It's symbolic to remind us, but Christ does not have to be sacrificed every communion service or mass or whatever you call it. No, he's done it once and having done it, has entered into the presence of God to remain in the presence of God. And it is a permanent, fixed, once and for all, done. That's why our salvation is so relevant, because when we come to Christ and confess our sin, that's done. You don't have to come confessing every week, every day. That is done. Salvation is done and finished. It's a completed work in Christ. So let's look at verse 23. It was therefore necessary that the patterns of things in the heavens should be purified, but the heavenly things themselves with better sacrifices. So what Paul is saying is that the earthly sacrifice under the Mosaic law only covered temporarily and only covered our physical aspect. But when Christ who entered into heaven, now through Christ we can enter the glory of heaven. That's why when Jesus in that moment of his death on the cross, the Bible says clearly the temple, this temple veil, you remember the veil that separated the high priest? That veil was torn from top to bottom. So God, from top down, split that so that you and I can now enter into that inner holy place. And in verse 25, it confirms this because it says quite bluntly, nor yet that he should offer himself often, as the high priest had to do every year, Otherwise, in verse 26, he had to suffer many times since the foundation of the world. But now, only once in the end of the world has he appeared to put away by the single sacrifice of himself. You understand? And in verse 27, as it is appointed unto men once to die, but after this the judgment, so Christ was once offered to bear all our sins. He died for the whole world, to pay the price of the whole world. And unto everyone that looks to him, the next phase is that he will come and appear again and take us for the final part of our salvation is when we enter through that final veil permanently into the presence of God. You know, this is such a powerful chapter, this one. And I just pray that you do fully understand how that the sacrifices, and yes, I know there are so-called priests today who make sacrifices. Christ is the only sacrifice that can atone once and for all for our sin, 
because he is the Son of God and he presented himself with the blood that he shed before the Father. He doesn't come out of that holy place. He's there and in him we have the testament, the will that we can in Christ inherit all that he had. Oh, that you would go further into this and I would going further into it. You have to just listen because we're going to get much deeper in the future. But this is enough for now. God bless you. Thank you for listening. My God will supply all your needs according to his glorious riches in Christ Jesus. What a wonderful promise. When you are committed to and support the gospel, then stand on this promise that when you give to the extension of the kingdom, God will supply all your need. Jesus called it giving and receiving. This year God has given us wonderful opportunities to preach the gospel in Armenia, Georgia and Poland. And we continue to support Ukraine by distributing humanitarian and spiritual aid. For 12 months, our staff have helped the displaced, vulnerable and injured, supplying food and medicines. To make a donation, visit eurovision.org.uk forward slash donation. We would like to give you a free gift. David Hathaway's Prophetic Vision magazine is available free of charge. All you need to do is ask for it. This faith-building resource will show you the path to revival in your life and ministry. To receive this free magazine, visit eurovision.org.uk forward slash magazine. Strength for now and for eternity. David will guide you through the Apostle Paul's letters to the Philippians, Colossians, and Philemon. David has written this book to strengthen your faith at a time when everything around us is being shaken. Join David as he delves deep into the truths of the Bible. Order David's book, A Firm Foundation, by visiting our website, eurovision.org.uk forward slash shop.